We're gonna record this right now. We're gonna record this right now. Welcome back, everyone. Hello. Hey, y'all. Um, my name is Mars, and uh, I think my microphone is doing the way, doing the most. I think my microphone is doing the most. Oh, there we go. We're at a healthy level now. All right, so uh, let's get started. Welcome back, everyone, to a little bit of crime. Um, I'm your host, Mars, aka Raven Rider, aka That Bitch, and we're here today. Um, bringing you the second episode of A Little Bit of Crime. Um, don't have a theme song yet, but let's just, let's just take it. Ready? A little bit of crime. Yeah, that's as good as it's gonna get. Hi, hey, hello. How are y'all doing this week? I hope you are doing well. My week has been a bit of a hit or miss, you know, every day, just taking it day by day, but, um, that's what you do. You just try to make it by, and we're trucking. We're trucking along, um, and I am excited to talk about what we're talking about today. We are going to be talking about the Netflix documentary, Girl in the Picture, and let me just say, y'all, this documentary had so many twists and turns. This, I mean, the, the things that happened to the poor girl in this documentary are just sickening and it's, it's very trigger warning just gonna full-on put on trigger warning central you know but first warning this podcast may not be for young listeners there will be graphic content discussed as well as graphic language listener discretion is advised all right, y'all. So, girl in the picture. I don't even know how to do a summary because it's so hard to keep up with. So, I'm just going to play y'all the trailer. In 2002, a friend sent me a photograph. It was a picture of a little girl, her father. The more you looked at the picture and the more you looked at her, you could see something was terribly wrong. The only person that knew her real identity was her father. Franklin Floyd had been a fugitive for almost two decades. He robbed a bank. He had a history of violence. He was an expert in concealed his identity. He had a daughter, Sharon Marshall. She wanted to go to Georgia Tech, be an aerospace engineer. I remember the phone call, and she said she was pregnant, but Daddy won't let me go to college now. We discovered that they changed their names. He took her around to strip clubs to make a living for him. There's a big question here. What happened to Sharon Marshall? It's an investigative journalist. You try to get down to the truth. All this information, very simple to analyze, and we had a real problem. This is more than just a crime story. Who is this girl? She went by many names. We had a portrait of very different people. This beautiful young woman was trapped in evil. She was stuck and didn't know how to get out. What happened? And who the hell is she? We're starting out, okay? Oklahoma City, April 1990. Late at night, okay? There's a couple guys driving down the road and they see something in the road. You know, they look off to the side, kind of in the road, and see the body of a blonde-haired woman. And they call an ambulance, because what the fuck else would you do when you find a body? Like, what the fuck is that doing there? Ambulance comes, they rush her to the hospital, and as she's at the hospital, a man arrives claiming to be her husband, Clarence. Clarence Hughes, to be specific. Clarence and Tanya were married. Tanya worked as a stripper, and they had a son named Michael. Um, they describe Clarence as a weird guy, you know, he's kind of acting off as he's in the hospital with Tanya, and they're just, they're just not sure what's going on, okay? But as the doctors are looking at her and reviewing everything, they see old injuries. They see old injuries, and they begin asking questions, you know? And, sadly enough, Tanya ends up dying. Passing away. Gone. And this starts a fucking manhunt that opened a Pandora's box that no one could have predicted. The girls that Tanya worked at with at the strip club wanted to find her family when she died. They wanted to, you know, wanted to let her family know that she was gone. So they found Tanya's mom in the phone book. They opened the phone book, just went down, and they found who they thought was her mom. So they call who they thought was Tanya's mom and find out that Tanya Hughes 
was her baby girl that died years ago. And that this Tanya Hughes that they thought they knew was not her real name. And so it leads to the question, who is Tanya Hughes? Now, I know we're kind of rushing through this first little bit, but y'all, I've got eight pages of notes and there's so many people and twists and turns and I'm trying. We're going to try to follow along, okay? So now the girls have a mystery on their hands. Who's Tanya? Who is this girl that they worked with, they spent their time with, they loved because of what an amazing person she was? Who was she? And that led into the bigger question of who was Clarence? You know, they all thought he was weird. They all thought that something was off with him. They didn't like him. Always kept a watchful eye on Tanya. Was always up there watching her. And so they knew that there was something dangerous to this story. At this point in the documentary, we cut to the bar. And we meet Karen Parsley. Now, Karen worked with Tanya. They worked at a strip club called Passions in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1989. They were the babies of the group, and uh, Karen says that's why they got along. You know, they were both around the same age. They were the youngest, and they became close friends. She said that Tanya was smart. Um, you know, her husband, Clarence, was a lot older, and they had the two-year-old son, Michael. She said that Michael meant everything to Tanya. Karen said that Michael was a happy child, and he would he, but he would never be next to Clarence. He was a happy child, but he never really interacted with Clarence, his dad. He, he, he just didn't, didn't have that relationship with Clarence. But Michael was attached to the hip of Tanya, and Tanya and him had a bond like no other. But still, there was something off about Clarence. He always had to be around. Michael couldn't go anywhere alone with Tanya. Clarence always had to be with both of them. And as Karen worked with her more, she saw that Tanya had bruises all over her backside. And Tanya would say that she slipped and fell, you know. Well, it got to the point as time got on, Tanya started admitting to Karen that she was worried. She told Karen that Clarence had taken a life insurance policy out on her and that she was scared and wanted to run away, but she couldn't leave without Michael and she could never get away from Clarence with Michael. Clarence never allowed her to be alone with Michael. And so she was stuck. Tanya felt like she had no way out because she couldn't leave her son, but she was scared. And she had a feeling, she had a feeling that Clarence was gonna do something to her. Now on April 25th, 1990, Clarence called Karen and told her that Tanya had been involved in a hit and run in Oklahoma City. And immediately, you know, Karen has questions, you know, cause Tanya's her biggest fr friend, biggest and best friend, but she never told Karen they were going out of town. Why didn't she? She always told Karen what was going on. You know, it was odd to her. You know, so Karen has a lot of questions and then that conversation comes into her mind of Tanya worried about the life insurance policy. So she's just confused. Clarence told Karen that Tanya was in the ICU and that no one could see her. Karen went anyway. Tanya's her best friend. So she went anyway. She went up to the hospital and the nurses came in and they told her that they thought it was foul play, that there were scratch marks on Tanya. At this point, we meet Dr. Charles Inglis neurosurgeon. Now, he said that Tanya had brain swelling. And although she had brain swelling, she was in good shape for it to be a hit and run. You know, in his other instances, there it's a lot more violent, you know. <sighs> then unfortunately, the hospital called Karen and told her that Tanya had passed away. And Tanya was only 20 when she died. Now this was when she gets up and she gets with all the other girls and they start to look for Tanya's family. Cause you know, they felt her family should know. And they knew Clarence wasn't gonna tell them. So they go looking and this is when she uncovers the mystery and she begins to wonder who is Tanya? And when she figures out that Tanya was an alias, Karen immediately freaks out. She didn't think Michael was with Clarence. She didn't know Michael wasn't safe. Michael wasn't safe with Clarence. Clarence wasn't who they thought he was. So it's clear that Michael isn't safe. So she went to the hospital and they gave her um, Child Protective Services information and she contacted. It was at this point that Child Protective Services came in and took Michael from Clarence and put him in a foster home. And let me just say, good fucking riddance. Good fucking riddance, because fuck this Clarence guy. 
Fuck him. Okay. Oh, y'all don't even know yet. Y'all don't even know. All right, now we are entering and we are meeting the foster parents of Michael. Um, their names were Merle and Ernest Bean. And they are, I mean, in this documentary, they are two of the sweetest people. Like, you can tell that they loved this boy. They were planning on adopting this boy. They were going to make this boy their own. And they loved him more than anything. He had just celebrated his second birthday when they were got the call to come and get him. And when he, uh, when he came to live with them, they were told that he was still on bottles at two years old and he was only allowed to drink Pepsi. And of course Merle laughs and said, no, I broke that that first night. He wasn't allowed no more Pepsi. Because what two-year-old gives, who gives a two-year-old fucking Pepsi? They got Michael on May 1st, 1990, the day after his mom had died. And he did not like being told no. He would throw fits. He he just, he you could tell that he had been in a volatile environment. You know, he acted out. But as they took him off the Pepsi and off the bottle, and once he, once he got used to them, he started to settle by the end of the week, and they said he was a completely different kid. Completely different. They had Michael for four years, and in that four years, he blossomed with them. But during that whole four years, they had been fighting back and forth vividly with Clarence. Because Clarence was trying more than anything to get Michael back. Because he's a piece of shit. I mean, Clarence... Clarence would make these ridiculous claims that Michael was locked in a room at their house, that he had no toys, in an interview we see him in front of the cameras and he's playing victim. I mean, he has a stupid looking mustache and he's using Tanya's death for sympathy, saying, oh, they came and stole my kid from me when, as soon as my wife died. It's just a bunch of bullshit. Bullshit. But it was evident that Michael didn't like Clarence. I mean... But it was evident that Michael did not like Clarence. I mean, the Bean said that Michael didn't like going on visits with Clarence. He called Clarence that mean man. And he, he, he hated Clarence. And all this time during the whole four years that he had been with the Beans and they had been fighting back and forth with Clarence, you know, everyone just assumed that Clarence was the father. You know, that there was no reason not to. He was married to Tanya. That was their, they claimed that it, that was their child. So there was no reason for anyone to question it. But they did. They did. So, Child Depart Protective Services called. And they wanted to do a paternity test. They were like, come on, man. Do a paternity test. Let's get this down. Let's prove her with father. Just some paperwork. No big deal. Until it proves that Clarence was not... Michael's father. You are not the father. <laughs> then and there, they terminated Clarence's parental rights. They said, you're not the father. You have no right to this boy. Later. Bye. And you got to think, too, in the back of their mind, they're, 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 you know, they're quietly thinking that he had something to do with Tanya's death. But, but, that out loud, they ain't got no proof, so they're just, you know, trying to keep Michael safe. Why not? Well, Clarence wasn't taking no for an answer, because this was a habit of his. He didn't like taking no for an answer. He started stalking them. He would drive by their house. He would watch them. At one point, Miss Bean called it in, and... The police called her paranoid. They called her paranoid. She wasn't paranoid enough, I guess, because on September 12th, 1994, cops get a call that a man has been found in the woods tied to a tree and duct tape. And that man was the principal of Michael's school. See, Clarence casually walks into the school and asks to see Michael's principal. And here we are meeting Assistant Chief Billy Carter with the Choctaw Police. And he's going after, over this with us, okay? He's going over the events of this day because he was working it. You know, he, Clarence goes to the principal and he says he's there to get his son. He pulls a gun partially out of his pocket and says, I want to get Michael and you're going to help me do that to the principal. He says that if the principal didn't help him, the principal was going to die. So he walks with the principal into Michael's classroom and kidnaps Michael. 
and takes the principal with him. He takes the principal's truck and drives to a deserted road, dirt road, walks a little bit into the woods, ties the principal to a tree and leaves him there. They contacted the FBI the next day and here we meet agent Joe Fitzpatrick and I love Joe, okay? He is this glorious old man. He's got his all suit, suit on. He's got his cute little white hair going. He's sitting in a diner, got a cup of coffee. He is he is going over the good old days with this case, and I love this man more than anything, y'all. He is so pure, okay? He's so pure. I just, he's my favorite out of this documentary, and he truly, truly is the big reason behind the justice that got served in this case. But we meet him, okay? He gets the call about what's happened with Michael, and he immediately puts a bolo out to all agencies about Michael. Well, he starts going over history, trying to look into stuff about Clarence. See who he is, what's the story, all that. And he finds that in 1990, Clarence Hughes tried to collect on his wife's life insurance. But the social security number he used came back to a man named Franklin Delano Floyd. And that is where we learn Clarence's real name. Clarence's real name is Franklin Delano Floyd. And he has a lot of aliases, okay? So I'll be going through those through this podcast. Now, some of the other aliases he went by other than Clarence Hughes was Trenton Davis and Warren Marshall. And looking at his criminal history, we see that in 1962, he abducted a girl. And in 1963, he robbed a bank. He was put in prison and then released in a halfway house in 1972. And in 1973, he attacked a female and he was arrested and made bail. And he had been on the run ever since. At that point, he had been on the run for almost two decades. He had served 10 years in the 60s, but not been there, done that, and he was now on the run. And this brought out a lot of questions about Tanya. Okay, who was Miss Tanya? You know, who, what, what happened to her? Who killed her? You know, who, who did this to her? And immediately, everyone's suspicious. Seeing Floyd, seeing Franklin Floyd's history, mm -hmm. they think he did it. They think he did it. Now cut to 1994. They find that there was a report of a kidnapping. And they get a call to the FBI from someone named Jenny Fisher. And she said she knows who Tanya Hughes is. She says her real name is Sharon Marshall. And she's from Forest Park, Georgia. And they were best friends in high school in 1984. Now here we meet a couple of Sharon's classmates, and I will be referring to her as Sharon from now on, okay? Now, Jenny tells that they went to high school together, and we meet some other high school friends of Sharon's. We meet Sherry Hortson Berry and Lynn Clemens. Sherry talks about how all the boys loved Sharon, how she was smart in multiple clubs and gifted programs, but how, how her and her friends were also kind of the outcast. But Sharon went for the underdog. She went for the outcast. That's just the type of person she was. And Lynn said that Sharon helped him make it through his high school years. That she was happy and she always wrote him little notes to make his day. They say that Sharon was mature for her age. And she wanted to go to Georgia Tech and be an aerospace engineer. And she even got in. She got into Georgia Tech and was so fucking happy and so excited. And, you know, it seemed like her dad was just as proud of her. Her dad bought a full page ad in the yearbook to brag about her and say congratulations. But some of her friends thought that it was kind of weird. And they thought that her dad was strict and a little bit weird. Jenny says Sharon's dad pulled her dad aside at one on the first day and asked for a loan. And regarding her mother, Jenny said Sharon told her that her mother was hit by a car and died when she was in second grade. Sharon said it was just her and her father. And Jenny said her father was strict. Sharon had to cook every night. It was evident that her father made her anxious and nervous. In their senior year, Sharon called Jenny and told her that she got pregnant. 
She says she's going to have the baby and put it up for adoption. But because of this, her dad wouldn't let her go to college now. In her words, somebody's got to take care of daddy. Then Jenny gets a call. Sharon says they're leaving Arizona and they're going to go out and put up the baby for adoption. Now we flash forward again to 1994 and we see Jenny meeting Joe Fitzpatrick after she calls the tip in. And Joe tells her, not only is Sharon dead, she's not who you think she is. And that Clarence, her supposed husband, they have now figured out, was her father, Warren Marshall. And Jenny is shocked. And Jenny is shocked. Jenny can't believe that they think that Sharon is Warren's wife. She doesn't want to accept that. That's, that's, that Warren is Sharon's father. Her father. There was no way in her mind. It's then we bring to a point that Joe realizes Tanya also has aliases. And in 1989, one year before her death, they changed their names. The names were taken off some tombstones in Alabama and they got married under those new names in New Orleans. Joe says, and I quote, this man married his own daughter. Now, y'all, when this, when this bombshell was dropped, when this bombshell was dropped, my jaw dropped, okay? In this documentary, we're not, we're not even, I have eight pages of notes. We're on page three, okay? I mean, this man, this pathetic excuse of a man married his own daughter? What the fuck? What the? And then had a son with her, who we, now we find out isn't his son, so who, who is the father of Michael? There's so many questions, okay? We're not even... Oh. All right, so then Joe asked, asked the question. Now they've got to figure out what happened to Sharon from high school until she was found dead. Because as of right now, they have no proof that Floyd killed her. Killed her. They got no proof that he's involved. Now, they figure out that she was employed as a stripper in Tampa, Florida at Mon Venus at the time of her death. So now we meet Heather. Her and Sharon work together at Mon Venus in Tampa, Florida. And we're throwing it back to Tampa, 1988. Now, it's said that Sharon was very shy, okay? She never walked around naked like everyone else. She didn't talk about herself. And girls in the club talked about how her dad and her kind of had a weird relationship. You know, Sharon's dad told her to ask about parties and say she was available for the extra stuff. And at one point, Heather took Sharon to a millionaire's party. She was standing outside the bathroom door offering sex services for men for $50. When Heather confronted her about it and asked her about it, Sharon said her dad told her to and even gave her condoms. What the fuck? It was in the same year that Sharon got pregnant again and she had Michael. And everyone says she was a wonderful mom. That he was the best thing to happen to her. He loved her and she loved him. Now, we meet Michelle Couples. And she was Michael's babysitter in the mobile home park they lived at in Tampa. She started babysitting Michael when she was 15. She lived a block from Sharon and Warren. And they lived in a normal trailer. Sharon had a friend, Cheryl, and she would come over one to two times a week, and she was also nice. Cheryl apparently worked with Sharon at the club, and Cheryl had hopes to be in Playboy as a model. And um, Michelle says that one day, she was there watching Michael, and uh, sees something she's not supposed to see. He's playing the VCR, and a tape plays, and he sees a video of Cheryl and Sharon, and they're topless, dancing on the beach. And Michelle gets up immediately and leaves, and he's angry, and she never tells anyone. Now, Warren's hell-bent on getting close to Cheryl. He says he'll take photos and get Cheryl into Playboy, but in reality, he was just trying to have sex with her. You know, she, she, she was fighting him off. She didn't want him, you know. And Heather sees this. He sees them fight. She sees them fighting, and she warns Cheryl. She says, Cheryl, you stay away from them because I can't protect you from them. And suddenly, Sharon and Warren disappear. They're gone. Now we have Jenny in front of us again, Sharon's best friend. And she's telling a story of how she never spent the night over at Sharon's house. Her dad was really strict. Her mom was. And, and they just didn't want her to be over there. They didn't really like Warren, you know, whatever. 
Well, one night, her dad was working out of town, and her mom allowed her to go to Sharon's house to spend the night. And, of course, says, don't ever tell your dad I'll let you do this. While she's there, and they're changing, getting ready for bed, she sees some sexy lingerie in Sharon's store. And she's like, where'd you get that? And Sharon says, oh, daddy buys these for me. And Jenny's confused. You know, who's... What father is buying their teenage daughter lingerie? Like, what? And as they're standing there, Warren comes in, drunk, and she says there was no doors in their house. They had curtains, but there was no doors. And Warren comes in, and she's not dressed all the way. She's trying to cover herself up, and he points the gun at them and screamed, What are y'all doing? And Jenny's, you know, freaking out, scared, whatever, and he walks back out of the room, and Sharon laughs, and she looks at Jenny, and she says, Oh, Daddy's just being silly. After they're changed, Warren comes back in, and he still had the gun. And a trigger warning here for y'all. But he ordered Jenny to lay on the floor and put a pillow over her head. And as Jenny's laying on the floor with the pillow over her head, she hears him rape Sharon at gunpoint. And Jenny said she just laid there still until he was done and he got up and left. And she was just sobbing and crying. The next morning, after Jenny had left and went home, Sharon came over. And she told Jenny that Daddy's just like that. She said, I'm okay. You're okay. Just let it go. Sharon was scared to talk or say anything, and so Jenny didn't tell anyone. Now, Joe felt personally about this. Joe, our favorite FBI agent, he, he, he is angry. He says she was used. He forced her into strip club work to make money for him. You know, he used her. You know, Floyd committed sex acts against Sharon. He had a history of abduction. Sex acts, you know, he had been convicted in 1962 of abducting a four-year-old girl and raping her. He had been con he was a convicted pedophile. In the 90s, he'd attacked a woman. He has a past opened up pattern of behavior, Joe says. A neighbor from the 70s of Floyd. This neighbor had a picture of Floyd with Sharon when she was about five years old. Joe goes and talks with the neighbor. They see this picture, and Joe's doing the math. You know, this picture was taken in the 70s. That would put Sharon's birthday around 1969, 1970. And during that time, Floyd was in prison. He was in prison around the time that Sharon was estimated to be born. So there was no way that he was her biological father. And this is the moment that Joe and everyone else realized he had kidnapped Sharon. He had kidnapped Sharon, and he had kept her for over 15 years. And this is the moment they realize that Sharon is not her real name either. So where and who is Sharon? Now, while Floyd was on the run with Michael, Joe came up with a plan. You know, they realized how much danger Michael was in, you know. So Joe came up with a plan. He figured, looking at Floyd's behavior and how he was, that Floyd would use one of his old aliases. And so he put a stop on all old aliases and contacted states that Floyd had lived in before. And, you know, thinking that maybe something, something would pop. And it did. They got an identity for Warren Marshall in Louisville, Kentucky. They seen where Floyd had went there and requested a new ID under the name of Warren Marshall. They got the picture, everything made, and was just waiting for it to be dropped off in the mail. So they found his address. They had an agent dress up as a UPS driver to deliver his driver's license to him, and they delivered it and arrested him on the spot. And can I just say, what a fucking stupid dumbass. Like, if you, if you were a criminal, I'm, I'm, I, I just need to speak on this for a minute. If you are a criminal, okay, if you are on the run, don't use old aliases, you dumbass. Like, that's, that's gonna get you found. Like, are you that stupid? Like, thank God he was that stupid. But my, I'm just mind blown that, you know, he would think he's like, which he's a narcissistic piece of shit, y'all. He literally doesn't think he's done anything wrong. So, like, I just don't. I just can't get it. I just can't get it. So, I'm just going on a tangent here. But he's so fucking stupid. He's so fucking stupid. Oh, but here we go. Joe's happy, okay? Let's go, Joe. Joe Fitzpatrick, he <clears throat> gets it done. And they immediately go to his residence and apartment building and they talk to every single one of his neighbors. They flip through his shit, talk to all of his neighbors, talk to all of his employers, people he has worked for. And no one knew anything about Michael. No one had seen Michael. No one had heard of Michael. No one. There was nothing. 
and when they did some further digging, they saw that Floyd had purchased a bus ticket from Atlanta to Louisville, but only one, only for himself. So where was Michael? You know, he. The, you see them in the in the documentary. They show press footage of him being brought in, and he says, you know, I love my son. You know, I wouldn't do anything to my son. Blah 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 blah. And he even goes as far to tell Joe that Michael was alive. You know, Floyd told Joe that he left Michael with a rich person to take care of him. You know, they had all this money, and he was going to be fine. And Joe says they were all lies. It's all Floyd know how to do. Joe, of course, thought Michael was dead, but hoped he was wrong. We cut back and we see an interview of Michael's foster parents, and it just breaks me. You know, they're, they're always wondering if he's out there. You know, they have no closure. They don't know what, what happened to him, and we see footage from when he's missing where they're just pleading for him to be brought back. Because these people, that was their son. They had him for four years. They were literally about to finish the paperwork to adopt him, and, and they were broken. They were broken. Now, as Floyd's arrested, they, they don't have a body, you know. They don't have a body, so they can't charge Floyd with Michael's murder because it's all circumstantial. You know, they can't really prove that he has killed Michael. So they decide to charge him with kidnapping of Michael and carjacking, using a firearms, and also using firearms during the commission of a kidnapping. And he, looking at a pr pretty hefty sentence, you know, there's one agent that, he makes a statement as Floyd was being brought into the courtroom for this. He uh, has a stare that looks like a Charles Manson stare. And we see this in the footage of him being walked to the courtroom. And can I just say that is dead center. I mean, he looks emotionless. He looks like a demon. Okay. A demon. That's really what he looks like. Now, of fucking course, because he's a narcissistic piece of shit, Franklin Floyd represented himself. Okay. And let me just say... Don't ever represent yourself, okay? If you were in jail, get a lawyer. That's what they're fucking paid to do. They know the law better than you. Why these assholes choose to represent themselves when we know it does not make anything better is just beyond me. I mean, he, he thought he was the smartest person in that courtroom, okay? And the bad bitch Jenny, let's just say Jenny, Sharon's best friend, who we... I, I want a friend like Jenny. Because Jenny testified, okay? She went to this and she testified and she faced off against Floyd. You know, since Floyd was representing himself, he got to ask Jenny questions. And he asked her, he says, you drew your opinion of me from the FBI and what they've told you, correct? And y'all, Jenny's response, Jenny responded and said, no, I drew my opinion of you when I saw what lingerie you were buying your daughter. You were her daddy. You were her father. And at that point, Floyd's attorneys just threw their papers up in there. I mean, he was fucked. What, what, what are you going to say to that? You know, what are you going to say to that? We cut to Joe and he says, I've never lost a case at trial, ever. And can I just say, you brag, Joe. You brag. <laughs> you brag. Okay. And this one wasn't any different. Franklin Floyd was found guilty and sentenced to 52 years in prison with no parole. And as he's being taken out of the courtroom, you know, the press are all there asking him a bunch of questions, and Floyd starts ranting and raving, and he says, and I quote, fuck you and Oklahoma. <laughs> oh, what a dumbass, and he just keeps getting even more dumb, y'all, because this isn't even over. We're halfway through my notes, and we're not even over. A little bit after this, Joe gets a call, and it's from someone that says they found the principal's truck that Floyd had stolen. And when finding it, they found photographs taped underneath the truck. All of them were obscene, included in some of the photos were Sharon when she was younger. And there was also another woman they had not seen before in various stages of disrobe and beaten. And as Joe is looking at these photos, he says they had to have killed her because the extent of her injuries in this photos there's no way she survived this. And so he starts looking. And in Florida, on March 29th, 1995, a highway crew finds a decomposing human skull. After examining the human skull, they find two bullet holes and a broken eye socket and immediately classified it as a homicide. But it goes cold. They have no idea who she is. 
they found some clothes and stuff behind her, but none of it really led to anything, so it goes cold. And a year later, in 1996, when Joe finds these photos, he sends them out to just all these different police agencies. He says, let me know if you recognize who this girl is. And so, they, the police agency in Florida, receive the pictures from Joe. They see a shirt in the photos that matches a shirt that was found with this body and skull. They, rec they request the dental records, and they match dental records, and identify her as Cheryl Ann Camesso. She had been missing for six years, and she had worked as a dancer with Tanya at Montesino. They cut back to Heather, and um, she's talking about Cheryl and Sharon. And she said, after the video of Cheryl and Sharon, Cheryl started showing up with bruises and marks on her neck from being strangled. And it was evident that Warren was obsessed with Cheryl. He was calling the club constantly, asking so many personal questions whenever he called the club. And Heather got to where she would say that Cheryl wasn't working and she would hang up on him. You know, she tried to protect Cheryl. But one night she walked out and she saw Sharon's dad in the parking lot and Cheryl was next to his truck and they were arguing. And according to Heather, he said he was going to kill her. So immediately, Heather went in the middle, and she intervened, got in between them, and she walked Cheryl to her car. Got her in her car, and she thought Cheryl would go home. But that was the last time she saw Cheryl. And that was when Warren and Sharon suddenly leave. And as if this story couldn't get any more plot twististic, one night after Warren and Sharon leaves, a neighbor sees a man come in, go into their trailer for a little bit, throw a cigarette butt behind him as he walks out, and drive away. And suddenly, there's a huge explosion, and Sharon and Warren's trailer is burnt to the ground. There was many rumors, neighborhood rumors, that, you know, Warren had hired someone to burn it down. I mean, I'm just saying, I think he could have uh, got rid of some evidence that way, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Now we cut back to Joe, my favorite man, my favorite man, and it's, it shows that they now know that Warren left suddenly because he killed Cheryl. And as soon as he left, and that was when Warren decided to marry Sharon. He got them new identities of Tanya and Clarence Hughes, and he drove and married Sharon because he knew no one would question a husband, wife, and child. They weren't looking for a husband and wife and child. They were looking for a father, a daughter, and a grandson. It's now that they can finally charge Floyd with murder. And he is. He is charged with the first degree murder of Cheryl Camesso. And he faces lethal injection because it's in Florida, baby. Now, they take the photos to Michael's babysitter, Michelle, and ask her if she can identify anything in the photos that may have been in Warren and Sharon's trailer at the time. And immediately, she identifies the mattress where Cheryl is laying in the photos. Cheryl is on the same couch Floyd had, and she ha she can't you can't deny that she is adamant. And we cut to Joe, and he is just so happy that they catch this man on a death sentence. You know, he's so happy. He's been chasing this man for decades. He's been trying to get something to stick to this man for decades. And thank God, Floyd is found guilty of first degree murder, and he is sentenced to death by Floyd. But it's not over. It's not over for them. See, they have many unanswered questions still because there's many more plot twists to this. I mean, this 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 case is just crazy. So now Joe is determined to find Michael's body. All of these officers are determined to find Michael. You know, they they they've they've been looking for this boy for so long. But the years pass and time goes on and it gets time that Joe's retiring. And as Joe retires, he says they still hadn't found Mal Michael and they still didn't know Sharon's real identity. All right, now we're in the year 2002, and we're meeting a new character to the story, Matt Bur Burkbeck. Burbeck. Burbeck. Mike. Blah, blah, blah. Anyways, um, he is an author, and he writes a book called A Beautiful Child, and it is the story of Floyd and Sharon. And of course, he immediately calls Joe. You know, he immediately calls Joe because who are you going to call about this case? Call Joe. Joe, oh, oh, Joe Fitzpatrick, he's our man. If he can't solve it, no one can. Let me just say, and we know 
Joe felt close to this case. You know, he, he had made it his mission to find justice for Sharon and to find justice for Michael. And he explains that to Matt. He talks about who Sharon was. And as he hears more about Sharon and Michael, he, Matt makes it his mission to find out who she is. And it's evident that the only person that knew who she was was Franklin Floyd. So Matt reaches out to him and Floyd agrees to talk to him. Matt goes to the prison. He sits down and Floyd walks in and he has all his personnel files. The deputies uncuff him and they leave him with Matt. And Floyd immediately starts talking and won't shut the fuck up. See, in his mind, Floyd thought that Matt was there to free him. Floyd thought that Matt could get him off scot-free and get him out of that prison. And Matt goes into this little side tangent of what Floyd's history is, what he went through, what his story is. Boo, hoo, hoo, fuck, fuck, fuck. No one gives a fuck. I'm not going into that that because I'm not going to humanize this monster. Okay, I understand why the documentary did it. I understand why Matt did it. It is the part of the story, but I'm not going to humanize this monster. So we're just going to skip all over that part because I really don't care about Franklin Floyd's history. Okay, I'm not going to do it. Now, as Matt talked to him, he said that Franklin Floyd did not want to talk about Michael or Sharon. He did not want to admit to anything he did. He said, Sharon came with me. She was a darling. She loved me no matter what. And that's his own words because we hear the audio tape of it. It's really fucking creepy. And Matt says, and I quote, I didn't learn anything from Floyd other than he was psychotic. And by the end of the book, they unfortunately still have no answers of who Sharon is and where Michael is. But Matt published it anyway, hoping that maybe, maybe they could get help from it or something. And the book went off immediately it it, it it pops off and the internet sluice immediately went to work all over the world within a year everyone was looking for her. everyone was trying their hardest to find out who Sharon is and in 2005 they got a break they received an anonymous email that said would the DNA of Sharon's daughter help you plot twist of the century we are now face to face meeting Megan Sharon's daughter. She was a junior in high school when her aunt found Matt's book and told Megan's mom about it. In 1989, Clarence and Tanya wanted to put up their baby for adoption. They went to an agency, said we don't need any more kids. You know, Megan was supposedly Tanya's third kid, Tanya who we now know as Sharon, and they didn't want any more. So, six weeks later, Megan was born and her adoptive parents, by the time they arrived at the hospital, Megan was already there. And Megan's adoptive mother asked Tanya, you know, do you want to hold Megan? And Tanya says, no, I can't. And can I just say, Megan is gorgeous. She's, she's gorgeous. And she says she just wants to know where she came from. You know, in 2010, she decided to get a DNA test done. You know, Sharon had been pregnant three times. First time in high school, supposedly adopted. Then there was Michael and then Megan. So, you know, she just wanted to see who she was, if she could find anything, and that was that. But there were still no answers. And so by 2011, they decided to contact the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And we meet Ashley. The, she worked for the center, and um, she was trying to find out who Sharon was. She didn't have much to go on, and of course, she immediately contacted Joe. And Joe says... Sign me up. I'm out of retirement. Let's get back on the case. Joe gets out of retirement, comes on out, and he says, I'm ready. Let's find out who she is. But they know, again, the only person that has answers is Franklin fucking Floyd. So Ashley calls the FBI agents and Joe, and they figure out they need to go interview him again. So two FBI agents go to the prison, and they go in wanting three questions answered. Who is Sharon Marshall? Where is Michael? And were you resp responsible for Sharon Marshall's death? They said that they didn't even introduce themselves when Floyd walked in. He walked in and he started ranting for 45 minutes because he thought they were his attorneys. And they finally looked at him and were like, we're not your attorneys. And he said, well, who the fuck are you? And they said, we're FBI agents. We're planning on opening up the Michael Hughes case. And he looks at them dead set and said, I would appreciate if you'd close it. 
you know, he didn't want to talk about Sharon or Michael. He was he he didn't want he didn't want to give up anything, you know. So they're they're prodding him, they're poking him, they're pushing him, and Floyd starts crying. He gets emotional, and they start shouting at him, you know, getting loud. How did you how did you kill Michael? What did you do? What did you do? What did you do? Where is Michael? What did you do? And Floyd immediately stops crying. He stops crying. He looks up at them and says, "I shot him twice in the back of the head to make it real quick." Finally, admits to killing Michael. And we're cut back to Ernest Bean, Michael's foster father, and Merle, his foster mother. You can see the sadness. You can see the emotions of realizing that Michael's actually gone. You know, they they were so close to adopting him. The adoption papers were almost completed, like he was almost theirs. Franklin Floyd tells the FBI agents that he buried Michael near the Oklahoma-Texas border. And can I say the way they phrase this, I have a problem with, because l- let me just say. They say, and I quote, They dug and looked for two to three days, but could not find anything. They gave it 110%. Can I just say they gave it 110% my ass? Digging for two to three. Can we not go back around that area and do a little bit more digging? Can we not do like some type of sonar or some shit? Because I'm just, I'm just very concerned why they thought two or three days was enough time to be looking for this little boy's body. And like we never circle back to that in the documentary. We never go back to that to like, hey, we only spent this amount of time. Like, can we go back to that? Like, have we just given up looking for Michael's body? Like, I'm, I'm very, con- I'm very confused there, FBI agents. I have some questions and concern. Do y'all have a 1-800 line that I can um, call and contact about this? Because I just, I, I, I don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. I'm going to be real, real with y'all right now. I don't understand how saying two to three days of looking is 110%. Because let me just say, if I go missing, if y'all only look for my dead body two to three days, I'm going to be haunting all of y'all, okay? Nuh-uh. No ma'am, no ham. Mm-mm-mm. Nope, nope, nope. Mm-mm. I have so many problems with that, but we're just going to we're just gonna scoot on by, okay? Now, they continue with their interview of Franklin Floyd, and, you know, he starts talking about being a bus driver and how he meets a girl named Sandy, saying that she had lost her three kids to the state. And they said, well, what was your name when you met Sandy? And this is where we learn that Floyd had another alias. He says when he met Sandy, he was going by Brandon Cleo Williams. Floyd talks about how they got married and he talks about the three daughters, how they got them back. He gives the daughters names and where they were born. And the FBI agents ask, well, who's the oldest? And Floyd said, well, that's the one you're asking about. FBI agents say, well, where was she born? And Floyd says, Lavernia, Michigan. And the FBI agents say, well, how do you know that? Floyd says, I've seen the birth certificate. That's who you're talking about. That's who you're asking me about. And that is when they are able to find Sharon's real name. Sharon's real name, Suzanne Marie Sebeckis. And they get the birth certificate and see that her parents' names are Sandra Brandenburg and Clifford Savakis. Both are still alive. Where the fuck have y'all been? Okay. La- oh, man. And here we have intern from stage left, Sandra, Suzanne's biological mother. The FBI showed up at her door and showed her a picture of Suzanne, and she asked if they know where she is. Where's my daughter? She was 19 when Suzanne was born. Her and Clifford met in high school, and they were together all throughout high school and got married. And at the end of high school, they got married and had a baby. It was then Clifford was shipped off to Vietnam, and, you know, Sandra was home carrying Suzanne and had her all by herself. And Clifford didn't get to meet Suzanne until she was six months old. And he was different. And by the time he got back home for good, Sandra was seeing another guy and told Clifford that she wanted a divorce and moved her and the girls to a mobile home park. Then Sandra says... Their mobile home park was hit by a tornado, and she claimed that gave her PTSD. She couldn't take care of the girls. She just wasn't okay. And so she went to social services for help because she thought that's what you do. That's what you do when you need help. You go to social services. She told them it's not safe. I can't take care of them. And so social services, of course, took the children. Now, they called Clifford, and they tell him that they want to adopt all the girls to one family. You know, they gave him a choice. He could either take them or he could let all one family adopt them. And Clifford said he spent a weekend drinking and thinking. And, you know, he was living with his parents. He had just come back from the war. He wasn't okay mentally. He was still messed up from it. He didn't have a job. And he decided he wouldn't make a good father. And 
At this point, Sandra goes to a church. She was mess. She was crying. She just wanted her girls back. You know, she was not okay. So she goes to a church, and of fucking course, this is where she meets Franklin Lloyd. He sees her crying, and he comes up to her, and he asks what's wrong. And she tells him, you know, she lost her girls. She wanted her girls. And Franklin said, God sent me here to help you. And he tells her that they're going to get the children, and they'll get married, and he'll take care of them. And Sandra agrees. I have so many questions, Sandra. I have so many questions. Now, of course, when they get married, Franklin Floyd changes. He becomes violent, and she was scared of him. You know, I mean, it's just, that's what happens, okay? And she ends up writing a bad check to 7-Eleven and has to go spend 30 days in jail. And while she's in jail for those 30 days, she, of course, leaves her daughters with him, and he kidnaps all three girls. And when she's out, she goes to the police, and ask them for help, and they ask if she was married to Franklin, and she says yes, and the police tell her it was a civil matter. It turns out Floyd had dropped the youngest two girls off at an orphanage and had kidnapped Suzanne and taken him with her, her with him and had been on the run ever since. Now, I gotta say, I feel bad for Sandra, but I also don't. I feel bad for Sandra because, you know, that is a lot of things she went through, but it seems to me like she just gave up on looking for her daughter. You know, her daughter had been plastered everywhere. Everywhere. And Heather, Heather says it best. Heather, is, it's evident that Heather hates Sharon's mom. Or who we now know as Suzanne. Heather was kidnapped. She was kidnapped and missing for five years. And she said her mom contacted everyone for five years. And did everything she could to find Heather. And Heather was found. And Heather wants to know why Suzanne's mom didn't try harder. And I'm wondering the same thing. You know, I mean, why? Why didn't she try harder? I, if, if Little Bit went missing, if something ever happened to Little Bit, God forbid, I would move heaven and earth to find her. So, uh, to me as a mother, I, I completely understand where, where Heather's coming from, and I don't understand why Sandra didn't do more. And it's kind of evident, um, because Megan, who we now know as Suzanne's daughter, her, her adoptive mother contacted Sandra and, um, you know, was asking if she wanted to talk to Megan, you know, just trying to get a relationship. And she said Sandra did not care. And she says it did not do, go well. After learning Sharon's true identity of Suzanne, they decide that they are going to replace her headstone with her real name. And in 2017, on June 3rd, we see a small service to honor Suzanne Savekis. And her new headstone is revealed, and y'all, it is beautiful. We see everyone we love there. We see the agents. We see Joe. We see Megan and Suzanne's birth dad, Clifford, Matt, the guy who wrote the book, and many others. And of course, who's not there? Miss Sandra, whatever. But Suzanne finally gets the memorial service that she deserved. She can finally rest. And, you know, Clifford, Suzanne's birth father, as he's talking, he says one thing that bothers him is he never really knew who Suzanne was. But what helps him is meeting the people that knew her and talked about the person she was. You know, and he says, I can't talk to Suzanne, but I can talk to Megan, and that'll have to do. And it closes with us seeing Clifford and Megan together, and Megan tells us that she named her son Michael after her brother. And her and Clifford now have a relationship, and she sees her family, and she was able to bring her mom a little bit of justice. But y'all, I have so many other questions. I got so many other fucking questions. Can we just, can we just go over all, okay, first of all, where's Michael's body, okay? Where's Michael's body, okay? Has it been found? I don't know, okay? I don't think it has. This documentary just came out, so clearly they would have said if it has been, where is Michael's body, okay? My second question, okay? She had three children, okay? Where's the first one? Who is the first one? I, I know that's not none of my business. I know that they're hopefully living a better life and they did get adopted and everything is happy, but my nosy ass wants to know. And and, and this, this, this was very hard to follow. This was very hard to get an idea of. And I know there's a lot of names in this trying to follow. So I hope that I did a good job trying to articulate this entire documentary. But y'all, this documentary had so many fucking twists and turns. That I just can't, I just could I just could I just, what? What? So many twists and turns. I just couldn't even comprehend what it, what it was, you know? And um, I hope y'all were able to follow that. And um, I know some of y'all were planning on listening to this because you didn't think you could take 
watching the documentary so I hope this helps some of y'all because let me say it is very triggering it's very hard to, to watch um so I hope I just did a good job with this story y'all because it's it's got it's got so many layers to it that it just and there's so much we just don't know still I mean we still we still don't know I think I think Suzanne was murdered by Floyd you know I personally think Suzanne was murdered by Floyd you know allegedly um so what are y'all thoughts? What are, your, what are your thoughts? Do you think he did it? Do you, do we, what do you think about Michael? Do you think he actually killed Michael? And see, there's my thing too. Like, they never found the body. So what if Michael, and this is purely me getting into conspiracy theory territory. Like, you don't know. You just don't know Floyd because he lied about everything. So like, what if Michael is actually alive? You know, like, would he do that? Because as far as I know, I, well, yeah, he would do that. He's a fucking monster. So I just don't know. I have so many questions about this. So... If, if y'all do too, send me y'all's questions. Let's get a discussion going on in uh, the Facebook group. Let's talk about it. If you're not on the Facebook group, it's Mars Crime Tea Time. Join. We'll talk. We'll discuss this because um, I got a lot of questions about this. I got a lot of questions about this bitch. Let me just say that. Um, you can also follow me on TikTok at Raven Riders Life. Um, you can join my Patreon. You're getting a bonus episode on the Patreon this week about the Murdoch murders. So you can uh, join that if you want to. We're also going to be doing a movie night, Saturday night and Sunday night, watching uh, Keep Sweet. So if you're a part of the Patreon, you can get to join and be a part of that. So lots of fun things going on. Um, I hope y'all enjoyed this. I love y'all. Okay. Thank you for being supportive of me and listening to me talk. I'm still trying to get the hang of this. So I don't really know if I like this episode, just recording it. So we'll figure it out together, but that's fine. Um, but, uh, yeah, I love you guys. Um, it was daytime where you're at. Okay. Drink you some damn water. Okay. And if it's nighttime where you're at, get your ass to sleep and go to bed. Okay. And if you're driving, listening to this, make sure you're wearing your seatbelt. Okay. Also go to the speed limit. We don't, we don't need y'all dying. I don't need to be doing y'all stories, okay? Anyways, love you guys. Bye. Guess who's back? Light a flare. Look in my eyes. No one there. This country's dead. This scene is fake. Fuck your money. That's something I don't need to I take. I just did Everest. That's legend shit in my